about us. You're in for a treat. If you haven't ever heard of him or his work, this is going to be an eye-opening discussion for you, and I think it's one of the most important discussions that is happening in the environmental community right now. So we are especially lucky to have him. Um, so uh, he has been working on environmental justice related issues in 94, but he has, was an organizer for many years before that. Um, and uh, so just a few of the awards that he's won include um, the Sealy Center for Environmental Health and Medicine Hero Award in 2009, the Sierra Club's Robert Bullard Environmental Justice Champion Award in 2015, and a CEC Synergy Award in 2008. Um, he really is a treat. Um, we feel very lucky to have him here this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy and learn from his presentation. We're especially glad uh, because we want to encourage inclusivity and diversity within the environmental community, which tends not to be highly diverse, but we are very committed to increasing that diversity. And so with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Juan Carlos up here. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I think he's going to start the video. Well, we're not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Let, let me just say a few comments before we start. Uh, I want to thank the center, you know, for inviting us to speak. And thank you, Rachel, for that. And also to let you know that I've been a long-time resident of Houston, Texas since 1970. So I've been here a good time, and I'm, I'm retired. But uh, you know, you can't you can't get off of what you believe in, right? So so we've been fighting for environmental justice all this time. But just to give you a little bit of more information about the my bio is that okay is that uh, I worked for 15 years for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, a public employee union. And then I finally decided to quit because, you know, you do a lot of traveling all over the nation and whatnot. And when I quit, I couldn't find a job for about three years as an international union rep. You know, a lot of people are reluctant to hire you. So by coincidence, uh, my wife sent a resume to Louisiana, Bedford, Louisiana. There was an article that says, you know, we're looking for a community organizer that can work with people of color. And I didn't know, right? So anyway, I got a call. And they said, we, uh, we saw your resume, we're interested in you. And anyway, I ended up in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, working for environmental, uh, actually for Labor Neighbor, Louisiana Labor Neighbor Project. Now, let me explain that to you what it is. Uh, when unions negotiate contracts and they're not moving forward, they can call a strike, right? But the company can also shut you out. They can say, well, we don't want you to come back to work because you know, we totally disagree with this contract. So in Louisiana, the employees that worked for BASF, and this is the United States Steel Workers, uh, they were on lockout. The longest history of the lockout in our nation, they were locked out of returning to work for five years. So during this time, the community supported those workers. They helped them, you know, they were losing their mortgages, they would help them out. If their kids couldn't go to private school, they would also help them out. There's a lot of things that there was a lot of community support. So when those workers, those union workers, went back to work with BASF, they in turn decided we want to give back something to the community. So they created the Louisiana Labor Neighbor Project. And that's why I went to work with it. And what they wanted is they said, whatever the community wants, you do it. Because they supported our efforts for the last five years, you know, when we were unemployed. And it turns out that this project, Louisiana Labor Neighbor Project, mostly the community were concerned about environmental issues. And it was right after the executive order was passed in 1994. So we started, I started doing environmental justice work, not even really realizing what EJ was all about. But this executive order, uh, with the groups in Louisiana, Louisiana Environmental Action Network, and then Tulane University Law School, and Xavier University, Dr. Beverly Wright, and others, we were able to defeat a polyvinyl chloride plant that was moving into a predominantly African-American community. This community was called St. James uh, Citizens for Jobs in the Environment. And the facility that 
Shintech wanted to build was to make polyvinyl chloride, but it was going to be built a half a mile from an elementary school. So anyway, we won that fight, and that's in the books. Uh, it, it's the first case that the EPA said, you know, this company will not be allowed to build here because of environmental racism. That's another word for environmental justice. So, so it was a huge victory, and it was, and there, and from there, I've been doing environmental justice since then. I came back to Houston, uh, worked for the T TSU Law School Environmental Law and Justice Center for about ten years. And then they closed down the clinic, so now we don't have any law schools here in Texas that actually fight for environmental justice communities. So we started our nonprofit in 2006. We've been in a nonprofit organization for the last 10, 15 years. And it's been tough, but we've been fighting the, the struggles for uh, minority communities, people of color primary. And so that's another reason I'm glad to be here, because we see uh, generally when we talk about issues, it's mostly people of color that can immediately relate to what we're talking about. And, and I'm not saying you can't relate, but I hope that my, my experiences uh, will be reflective of what's going on in our communities and, what, and why we all need to get together and address those issues. So what we're going to start off with, what we do is we have a five minute video uh, that highlights the community that, that we're focus, focus our attention on, which is the Manchester community. And, and just as a side note, the New York Times is doing, a, this week they're doing a lot of stories on the Manchester community. They actually came down last week and they went and interviewed a lot of people in the community and, and they're showing it now. It's, it's been on Facebook, uh, two interviews already. So that's going, going to be going on. And there has been other national news actually devoted to the communities of Manchester and similar communities, but we haven't made any progress. And one of the things that I want to show you right now is a video that highlights this uh, Bolero industry in Manchester and all the industries that surround that community. And to this day, still nothing has been done politically or in-house with the, you know, the city the city department or any one of those. So you can start the video, Ms. Rachel. I'm sorry for having technical difficulties. Okay. So we'll show you a video, and then we'll show you a picture of uh, what the Chronicle put out. <coughs> when you see the video, you'll see that it's literally surrounded by industry. <laughs> and about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, the city of Houston, claiming that it's strapped for money, right, because of the pension fund with the firefighters and, and police officers, they decided to sell what they call property excess property, right? And they actually sold 10 blocks to the Valero industry, right in the heart of Manchester. So that means that that company now is going to expand farther into that community. Once you see the video, you see, you, it's going to be obvious to you, what are, you, what are we doing? This, this uh, industry is polluting Manchester, and now you get, you're selling 10 more blocks so they can farther encroach on this community? That's environmental injustice. And we need to know about that. And we need to uh, actually talk to city folks and figure out what's going on. But that's what the city right now is doing. They're selling a lot of properties off, claiming that it's under threat. Now, in this situation where they sold 10 blocks to Valero, we can go back to 2014, when this process of you know, buying houses, Valero agreed to buy houses in the area that they wanted to buy the streets. So they actually bought all those houses in the past three years. And now they're ready to buy those 10 blocks. But again, it's misleading because the facts are that this was initiated three years ago. We'll buy out these houses and then we'll buy off the streets. Mm -hmm. But now they're claiming again that, that it's because we're strapped for money. So those are the kind of issues that, that we want to talk about. Is it ready? I, I, I guess I'm not going to show you that video. So any questions? Anyone have any questions? Yes. Okay, the Manchester area, it's in the east side of town. If you take Harrisburg, if you're familiar with Harrisburg, you take Harrisburg all the way down till you get to Manchester Street. And then you make a left, and you go into the Manchester community. The Manchester community only had one way in and one way out. In the last, I guess, 10 or 12 years, they finally made another entrance into that community, and it's an overpass. 
They built the overpass because when you only have one entrance and the trains are blocking you and there's an emergency in the community, some of those folks were literally dying because they couldn't get emergency ambulance services. So they finally built an overpass that you can get into that community. Unfortunately though, is that when an ambulance driver uh, heads out to Manchester and there's an emergency and he runs into the trains and he doesn't know that there's another entrance, we, we still have the same issue. You know, maybe they, they're getting there too late. And also not knowing the fact that the train is blocking the entrance, right? Because we don't know the train is blocking the street until we actually see it. Hey, well, then I gotta go around. So that's where Manchester is. It's also, if you know where Highway 225 is, it's right in there to your left. That's where Manchester is. And by the way, we do toxic tours. We conduct toxic tours. We can take in a toxic tour and just show you all the environmental issues that are inundated in our communities. Yes, sir. I saw the New York Times uh, article this morning. It was really interesting in particular. I mean, Dr. Bullard was uh, quoted in it too. How big is the community? Uh, how many households are, um, are in that? And I'm also just kind of curious, uh, which Houston City Council District is in? It's in the, uh, the city councilman is right now Gallegos, Albert Gallegos. And he's the one that initiated the sale of uh, interest, city interest, in 2014. And uh, I know he denies that, but you know, that's, the facts are there, because he made a motion to city council to, to start the process of buying off houses so that those streets could be sold. But it's Mario, uh, no, it's not Mario Leves, it's Robert Gallegos. And the, the other part of your question was, what the, the size, you know, like, oh, the size. The, 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 what we call the heart of Manchester is probably about 600 to 700 homes, but the boundaries of Manchester extend beyond the heart of it, and it's maybe about five to 7,000 homes. That's, that's, that's where it is. Any other questions? I see we're still having technical difficulties. Oh, it's okay now? Well, it's only half good on the one screen, but it's really good on the other screen. <laughs> oh, okay, you have two screens. Well, y'all can look at what's the better side. <laughs> you want to go in and start then? It's done. Okay. Terminal license. From some unidentified gases coming from a petroleum refinery operated by Valero Energy Corporation. This single refinery emits millions of pounds of poisonous and carcinogenic gases every year. Three of the four sides of Manchester are surrounded by this refinery. The remaining side is blocked in by a train yard 25 tracks wide. This side of the refinery completely blocks the view of what used to be Buffalo Bayou. Now it is known as the Houston Ship Channel. This once thriving ecosystem has been reduced to a mere machine at the service of commerce. The Karankawa people lived along the banks of this bayou for thousands of years, drinking its waters and eating its fish. Since European colonists began settling along its banks in the early 19th century, it has become a mechanism to produce capital and serve the interests of business. Today, industrial development continues uninterrupted from downtown Houston, 50 miles southeast to the Gulf of Mexico. This giant symbol of colonialism and capitalism comprises the largest petrochemical complex on Earth and one of the most environmentally destructive projects ever carried out. Valero is not the only corporation polluting the air and water of the neighborhood. This is Manchester, in the center of this image. Now highlighted is the Valero refinery, a Rodia specialty chemical plant, a car crushing facility, a wastewater treatment plant, a Lion Delta Sal Sitgo refinery, a large train yard for hazardous cargo, a Goodyear synthetic rubber plant, a Texas petrochemicals refinery, and on top of all of that, one of the busiest highways in Houston. <laughs> there are war in Fifth Ward, Manchester, all the surrounding neighborhoods that are around downtown area are the oldest neighborhoods, and they get affected more by the pollution because the power plants are so close to the inner city. So I think that people need to really take, take uh, into consideration that these neighborhoods are suffering. The chemicals are only clouds, and it rains, and the chemicals come right back down. It's pretty much obvious, it don't take rocket sciences, you know, kids know that 
if you go, you know, you talk to a third grader in school, and they're gonna know that the chemical, whatever goes in the clouds, the rain ain't come back down. So I mean, people need to understand that these neighborhoods are getting affected by these chemicals. Había que que nos compraran el lugar para ir de aquí, para irnos a otro lugar más seguro. Eh, es insoportable la bomba que dan las las chimeneas. Y, ¿Y qué podemos hacer? Pues nada más aguantarnos. Aquí aquí por aquí la mayoría se se va preguntando en las casas van a encontrar que hay hay mucha gente dando. Pero qué se puede hacer si hacemos un grupo de un uh, cómo se llama que no podemos hacer nada y solamente tenemos que aguantar las cosas que pasan aquí y también tenemos, y también tenemos la, la, la que muere Carlos aquí enseguida para, al otro lado del, del, del C que es que, que muere y, y sobre todo los, los carros que los frenos contienen mucho al resto y todo eso está moliendo, se está yendo en, en el aire, en el polvo y no se puede hacer nada, pero no solamente estamos recibiendo todos esos químicos. Oklahoma, 
jointly, those two individuals filed 29 lawsuits against the EPA. So you can imagine encroachment of this type in communities of color. And the rest of us may be in the same boat pretty soon, because again, we have two uh, folks in there, Pruitt and Perry, who are very pro-industry and, and want to do away with a lot of federal regulations. Now, one of the things that uh, Trump is doing is he's also already taken a lot of public information off the website that we were, that was accessible and available to us to you know, do research of what's going on. So <clears throat> when Trump talks about doing away with the TPP, you know, we've turned that around. We say, yeah, well, we support that because you know, TPP is a Trans-Pacific Partnership. But in our case, we say it's Trump, Pruitt, and Perry. And so we've twisted that, right? And they don't like that, because we say, yeah, we support that. You know, get rid of Trump, Perry, and Ricky, uh, Perry and Trump. So anyway, this is Manchester, and we do toxic tours, like I said, and we can take you to that community. Our toxic tours are free. We don't charge for toxic tours, because we're, we don't want to make the citizens, or even those people that live in there, the residents that we work closely with, feel that we're going into like the zoo. You're planning to go see people in the zoo, right? Or, or how hard a life they, they have because of where they live. So our toxic tours are free, and we'll show you not only that, but we'll show you other sites in our community that are just as bad. You may have seen, you saw that, some, uh, that metal crushing facility, right? Well, that metal crushing facility is the same industry. It's right on Buffalo Bayou, right there by uh, Jensen Street. Recently, I read that uh, the Parks Department, finally, they're fixing to spend a lot of money to improve park space in the east end of, you know, Buffalo Bayou on the east end. On the east end, Buffalo Bayou is actually referred to as the Houston Ship Channel. But on this side of town, you know, on the west side of town, you have, you know, Memorial Drive and Allen Parkway. You see how beautiful it is, right? Well, we take you to our side of town, and we'll show you that it's not as beautiful as this side. But now they're fixing to spend a lot of money, sort of make it equal, right? Uh, have park improvements and bike trails and whatnot. And there's only a certain amount of money that's been allocated for that money that they've been able to raise. We suspect that if that money destined for park improvements, a lot of it's going to be taken up just to clean that site, Sims Metals facility, because it is a super fun site. It hasn't been declared a super fun site because they're still in operation. But I guarantee you it's going to take a hell of a chunk of money to clean that site up and other environmental issues on Buffalo Bayou on the east side of town. The uh, PowerPoint, any questions? Yes, in the back. How many people live in the community of Manchester? In, in, the, in the heart of Manchester, where the bulk of the you know, industry surrounds it, we believe there's about 3,000 folks and a lot of children. Question. Is anybody working to aggravate the medical data from the community so that they could do something like launch a class action lawsuit not only against the organizations that are running the refineries but the state? We've, uh, collect, we, we have collected a, a lot of medical data where we show high incidence of you know, even leukemia and asthma and, and other cancer-causing uh, issues. But that data is not sufficient to prove that something needs to be done as far as you know the, the policy makers. Yes? Are you working with either East End Management District or uh, Buffalo Bayou Partnership and also to identify the toxic sites that you think need to be cleaned up? We're not working currently with her, was four years old. She's 34 now. You know, so it's taken that long to actually start, you know, making it beautiful, just like Memorial Drive and Allen Parkway. So, yes, I know, and also, and I know others that are moving in that direction, but. Uh, Again, uh, we have not been invited to participate in those uh, discussions. Those that have been invited, I've told them, well, look, let's talk about cleanups, because there's going to be a lot of money wasted on cleanups. That's, that's our particular view. More questions? Yes? What would you like to see happen overall? Pardon me, I'm in here. What would you like to see happen overall? Well, overall, when we start addressing the Buffalo Bayou park related issues and park improvements, that's going to be great. We're not against it, okay? But we understand that in, that industry is just going to move farther east, east. So if it does that, it means that that industry is going to move closer to Manchester. 
We would like to eliminate it all. And we can do that if the city of Houston has zoning laws. But you know, absent zoning laws, a lot of poor, in, poor income communities, low income communities and people of color do not have the resources to fight industry coming into their communities. I'll give you an example. The uh, Ashby High Rise, right? That was in court seven years because of privilege, because of money and resources. They were able to keep the Ashby High Rise from getting built. But it finally, you know, they, it finally got built, right? But the issue was there that we're going to have too many people coming in here. There's going to be robberies, uh, no parking space. That doesn't happen in our communities. When we challenge things, we generally don't have the resources to fight them back, so then we get stuck with those kind of bad businesses in our community. Light rail. To give you another instance, light rail. We have four lines of light rail. All three of them have been paid by federal money. The only line that, that was not built by federal money was the Harrisburg line. Let me tell you what. We, they had discussions with us when they were building the Harrisburg line, you know, that it was being proposed. They said, well, we have an issue here. Should we build a tunnel under Hughes where there's a lot of rail? Do we go under or do we go over? The community decided, well, let's, let's go under. That's what we want. We want an underpass. We want to maintain the view of Harrisburg, you know, looking at the downtown area. So what they did then is they came back to us after they agreed that it was going to go under. They came back to us and they said, look, we want to hold a community meeting. And this is under Anise Parker. Uh, because we found contamination along the tracks. It's a plume of MTBE and benzene, and it's getting bigger. And to clean it up is going to cost $18 million. And we didn't budget for a cleanup, they said. We only budgeted, you know, for what we projected was going to be the cost to build a light rail. So they said, <coughs> we want to go over. They convinced the community, okay, let's go over, let's not worry about the cleanup. Again, if this were a community of privilege and resources, we would have fought and made them clean up. If it's going to cost $18 million, that's a lot of money to spend on the cleanup, but they didn't want to do it. If it had been somebody else, what I'm saying, it would have been cleaned up. Be, uh, people of different color, you know, and privilege. So we're stuck right now with an overpass, knowing that the bottom is contaminated, but here's what they told us how they would deal with that solution. They said, well, pave all of that area, and We'll let you park your taco trucks under there, do whatever you want. We'll build some basketball courts so that kids can play in there. And because the trains pass by so frequently, we'll put benches, park benches, facing the tracks. So because as people get older, they like to sit and watch the train go by. That was their solution to our environmental issues. And that's a slap in the face. But that's what they literally told us. And so we're supposed to be happy, right? So now the other thing, we, we have asked Congressman Jean Green, why is this the only area that was financed by local money? And he said, well, when you know uh, the federal government has a lot of environmental regulations, and if we did it that way, you know, we would have to do a lot more. So again, see, even our, our congressman could have helped us, could have made them clean up, but instead he says, well, you know, there's a lot of federal regulations, so we decided to do it on the tax increment reinvestment zone. And those kind of issues we have to, we are constantly fighting. You have the uh, PowerPoint? Oh, okay. My fault. Anyway, that's who we are. Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services. Let me see if I get it right. Where? Oh, it's, it moved? Okay. That's our mission to the statement. Don't expect you to read it all, but let me show you some other stuff. Okay, look. This is the uh, Highway 225 and I-10, and all of the refiners and chemical plants in this little, it's a 16-mile stretch of, from uh, the Ship Channel Bridge all the way to Baytown. All that industry is in there. So when we talk about reports that have been, and in fact, like Dana Capiello, when she was working for the Houston Chronicle, she did a report about toxic exposures 
especially focusing on Manchester, and she found out that in Manchester, that community and those surrounding communities are exposed to seven cancer-causing chemicals on a daily basis. But this is, look, look at all the industry. I'm just pointing out to you that when we talk to the EPA and even the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, there's over 2,300 points of emissions on those refineries. Points of emissions, like you mentioned in the exhaust in the car, there's over 2,300 points of emissions that this, the state is supposed to be regulating, but they're not good in enforcement. This is a picture of the Cesar Chavez High School. Right behind, a quarter of a mile from the Chavez High School says, says Texas Petrochemical, Goodyear Tire and Rubber, and it used to be ExxonMobil. Now let me tell you what, the uh, under the risk management plan, <coughs> Industry in 1996 had to submit what they call a risk management plan. Like, what is the worst thing that can happen in your, in your facility? And who are the people, or what is the circumference of the area that is considered the most dangerous zone? And the most dangerous being injury, death, or bodily harm, okay? The Chavez High School is within that inner circle, injury, death, or bodily harm, of Texas Petrochemical, ExxonMobil, and Goodyear Tire and Rubber. Meaning that three to 4,000 students, for no reason and no control, they can be exposed to those three things, injury, death, and bodily harm at any given time. Now, oh, let me see what the next slide is. Yeah, there's Dana Capiello, she did that report, yeah, it says who's in harm's way. Those are the seven cancer-causing chemicals that that community is exposed to. This is a study that was done by uh, University of Texas School of Public Health in the city of Houston where they identified the chemicals that they were exposed to. So it's all documented. This is sec the second documentation. That's the school. Obviously, you can see you know, the smokestacks. Uh, they, they flare frequently. It's, this is just one picture that we caught. The baseball field is actually behind the gym here. <coughs> Let me tell you about the, the Chavez High School because I think you ought to know about this. <coughs> Before it was constructed, we had meetings with you know school officials, city city officials, EPA, and we were making progress. We thought we were making progress with the EPA conven convincing what they call an interagency working group. Well, it got to the point that the EPA told us, you know, we're not going to have any more meetings. And the reason they gave us was because they said Congressman Gene Green had wrote them a nasty letter that we were outsiders. We had no business in you know, dealing with those issues. So they stopped meeting with us because of Congressman Gene Green. Now, before the school was built, we met with Carol Alvarado, who was a state representative. You know, she's a state representative. At that time, she worked with, with uh, Mayor Lee Brown as a community liaison. Uh, we met with Leonel Castillo. Some of you know Leonel Castillo. He used to be the director of immigration INS for Carter. And uh, Pamela Berger, who used to be the health director for the city of Houston. And Don Moses used to be the director for Brown Fields and Superfund Science. We used to have meetings with them after you know we disbanded the interagency working group or the, the uh, EPA disbanded because of the recommendation of Congressman Green. Anyway, we were meeting with them. And Leonel Castillo is the one that says, Juan, you know what? You have so many issues regarding the siding of the school that, that we're going to name the school after Cesar Chavez. You know, we met with Latino leaders and decided to name it after Cesar Chavez. What that did to us is community support backed off because, you know, this is like naming a school after MLK, naming a school after somebody famous. So they stopped participating with us, right? Because they named, named it after Cesar Chavez. Then thirdly, we said, well, look, that still doesn't avoid all the toxins we're talking about, all the contamination, right, that the students will be exposed to. So, and this is a, a summary of a almost a year and a half discussion with those four individuals. Anyway, the second thing they said, Leonel Castillo said, well, look, you raised all these issues, one, so we're going to make it an, an environmental magnet school. This way is now Cesar Chavez High School. We, we lost a lot of support. And now it's an environmental magnet school. And he says, what will happen is that in time, because they're study, studying about environmental issues, in time, Juan, maybe those students will walk out on their own. Again, we said, that's not enough. We still, you're not avoiding, you know, you're not dealing with the issues. You're avoiding them by just coming up with, you know, good phrases. 
So then guess what they did? They said, you want an air monitor on the school? Yes, we'll put one. And they named it after Cesar Chavez. So now we have an environmental magnet school, a Cesar Chavez High School, and they monitor to measure the toxins that those children would be exposed to at that school. But here's the tricky part. What they did then is we could not collect any data from the monitor that could confirm and, and verify what we had said. They moved it off premises to the far station. And then we started collecting data, and the data confirms what we were saying. But now it's off premises, so I guess that gives, it's OK, right? So anyway, the Cesar Chavez was built. The other thing we did is we, uh, at that time, I don't remember if uh, Silvia Garcia was our state representative or our state senator. But anyway, we asked Silvia to help us politically if she could help us you know, to deal before the school was built. How can we prevent it? And she found a rule that says that a school cannot be, no, a refinery cannot be built within a thousand feet of a school. But the reverse is not true. The school can build as close as it wants to the fence line of that industry. So she can help us. Back to Carol. Carol Alvarado said, well, look, one, I grew up in Manchester, and you get used to the smells. And she said, and why are you fighting so much from Cesar Chavez High School, the siding of it, and you're not, and you're not doing anything about the Melby High School? It's got the same issues, and it does. Melby High School has the same issues. So I had to remind her that, you know, the Melby High School was built in 1929. The executive order was built, uh, created in 1994. We cannot retroactively say, you know, you need to get rid of the Melby High School because it's an environmental justice issue. So those are some of the, the things that we did to avoid the situation for where we have now 4,000 kids going to this school, primarily of Latino descent, 98% of them. And there was another report. Let me see if it's here. Uh, the Texas Observer also wrote about our situation about the school and why it never should have been built there. Again, no confirmation from anybody else, no, no help. Uh, OK, those are the industries. Let me see. More reports. It's going on automatically. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, well, good. Good to know. But anyway, uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. That's Manchester in the background. It's a park in the middle of the community. Those, there's 92 tanks like this right down below. They used to belong to, to Rodea. And now it's another, you know, these companies are always selling and buying. So it's been sold off recently. I think it's Westgate. But there's 92 of them that store all kinds of chemicals on these tanks for the industrial use. Next picture. Double Jeopardy, that was a report done with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And they also concluded the same conclusion. I'm telling you, all these scientific people come up with the same conclusion. They're exposed to seven cancer-causing chemicals every day, day in and day out. Another slide? OK, this is the impacts. Uh, when somebody asked me about health impacts earlier, those chemicals identify some of the health impacts that people are not related to, like if they have a cancer, uh, whatever. Some of those chemicals can tell you what causes a particular cancer, like liver cancer, or lung cancer, or other types of cancer. Next slide. Yeah, again, the, this community is surrounded by 16 facilities that we have to deal with. We have tried to address cumulative impact statements on communities, and we've also tried to actually get attorneys to file lawsuits on behalf of, of residents that have serious cancer issues. But because there's so much industry surrounding there, it's even difficult for an attorney to say, okay, who's the responsible party here? That's what you have to deal with. Who's the responsible party? And so they have not been successful in fighting lawsuits against any of the industries in support of the community. Next slide. Uh, this is was, was in Washington, D.C. at the climate change uh, march that we participated on. And Charles Lee and his wife, uh, they are EPA officials in D.C. that are probably not going to be there long because they don't like the, what the Trump administration is doing. But they have been down here. They have meetings here with local folks talking and addressing environmental justice issues. Next. And this is in Spanish, but it says that 90% of the community has been exposed to you know, toxic chemicals. Next. OK. 
okay, more Spanish, the same picture next. This report was done by Lois Gibbs. You guys know Lois Gibbs? Yeah. Niagara, right? Okay, well, Lois Gibbs also did a, a touching report on schools. What they did is based on GIS, you know, research, they identified the worst schools in the nation because of what's next to them, what's, what they've been exposed to. And the number one most toxic school in the nation is Deer Park Middle School. That's the worst school in the nation. Now, on the top, 1% of the most toxic schools in the nation is Cesar Chavez. In the Houston area, there are 86 schools that are on the top 86% of the most toxic schools in the nation. No, on the top 5%. 86 schools in HISD in the top 5% of the most toxic schools in the nation. And they are all African American or Latino majority. Next. That's the same, same report in Hartsway next. Um, okay, Hart. Hart has done numerous studies also, Houston Area Research Center in Manchester. The latest research that they did was about a year and a half ago where they actually used laser beams. They put mirrors on towers and then just think about high technology and how, you know, how things are getting so technical. Then they, they push a beam from one mirror to the next, and, it, and anyway, it creates a grip of what it's in the air. And they also found out that this community is inundated with seven cancer-causing chemicals. Next slide. Uh, pipelines. This is a picture of all the pipelines that come to the southern states. So when we have any, any pipeline that, that is going to be dressed or dug up in any parts of the states, more than likely, whatever they're producing and these things are refined will come to Texas or Louisiana because we are the bulk of where all this industry is. So it's going to come down here and it's going to have impacts on us. Next. Let me see what that is. I can't see it. Let me go to the next slide. I can't see that. Okay. Okay, now, recently, you know, that the EPA passed what they call some. Uh, air quality standards, and they, they, they passed the legislation that the refineries are supposed to have fence line monitoring. It's been a, a difficult test because a lot of this industry does not want to put fence line monitors. They say, we're okay, we, we, we have enough equipment to test our air, and we don't need fence line monitors. Most recently, too, there's the refinery rule that deals with the issue of methane, and they don't want to deal with that too. They've actually delayed. The rule was supposed to be implemented uh, in March of this year, and the companies have actually delayed testing for methane releases and the amounts of it for another 20 months. That's what the Pruitt administration is doing. So again, look, there's a lot of issues that uh, I can talk about and, and tell you about what's going on in our community, but I do seriously believe that one of the best things we can do is take you on a toxic tour, take you into Manchester, and then visit with us so that you can see the disparities that exist in our own communities. And then politically realize that, look, we are the headquarters for the gas and oil industry. And, and we have turned this area, trying to get some politicians to really support, you know, a cleanup of the industry. We've come up with hashtag Houston to, you know, just kind of like a, be a pain in the butt here so that they can address that. Because the other thing that the city of Pasadena has done for the longest is they call themselves Stinkadena, right? Now we have Houston and Pasadena, brothers and sisters, Tinkadena, right? Brothers and sisters, to make a point here that we need our elected officials to do something about the air standards. And this, and we need a regional plan, like Mayor White was trying to do. We need a regional plan for the area. We can't just say to up to the boundaries of Houston, Texas, because it is right there at Valero. We need to go beyond that. So we're trying to get a regional plan established by those in power. But again, look. The, the EPA and Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, there's information, in, and you read the newspaper, it takes outsiders to come in and follow on the environment, the lack of in, enforcement on the environmental regulations. Sierra Club just recently did that. They came down, they filed a, a, a lawsuit against Exxon, and they've been fined $20 million, but it's still negotiating, right? 
They filed a lawsuit to go against Shell, and they won it by almost $3 million out of court settlement right away. They filed a lawsuit against Chevron, and they won that case too. So why does it take outsiders, outside national groups to come and defend this, file a lawsuit, because our own state is not doing that? So that's a huge issue too. Our state regulators are not enforcing environmental laws here in the city of Houston, and it has huge impacts on this. Any questions? Yes, sir. Where does the money from those lawsuits from the outside entities go? Okay, that's a good question because a lot of those monies, the company and the EPA and the regulators decide that it's in, it'll be given to a supplemental environmental project. So in most cases, the communities that are impacted by those releases don't see any money or nothing comes into their neighborhood. It's always a supplemental environmental project and it goes to like planting trees, maybe in the woodlands, planting trees in Galveston, uh, cleaning up the sea bay. It never really goes to the impact of the community. So we, we, when there are settlements, what we're saying, environmental justice groups, it should go to the community that was most impacted by it. Uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, air conditioned filters or filters to be placed in their homes. But something that benefits that community, even relocation. We have tried to get Valero and those 16 industries that surround uh, Manchester community. We've tried to get them to relocate Manchester, and what they tell us is they say, if we relocate Manchester, it's gonna have a domino effect on it. We're gonna have to deal with other communities from here all the way to Baytown, Deer Park, you know, Galena, all those communities. So they, they refuse to bargain to me, relocate anyone here because they know it's gonna be costly in the long run because other communities will say, well, we're in the same boat. We need to be relocated. So that's, that's where pressure from politics comes in, where we either make them pay the fines that they should be paying for violating the Clean Air Act, so that there's money at least to deal you know, in helping communities settle with that, or we, we seriously talk about relocating people in, along the entire Houston ship channel. In harm's way, also identified the fact that if you live in, in a, within a two mile radius of the Houston ship channel, there's high rates of leukemia. I mean, those are obvious, you know, it's not like, they say it's not a rocket scientist like that man, uh, that young man said. Uh, those are obvious facts. That they're scientifically proven, and yet nothing has been done along those communities. On the issue of homeland security, let me just tell you, and it's almost time, but on the issue of homeland security, at that time I was working at TSU Law School, and the attorney general for the southern part of Texas, he spoke at TSU like six months after 9-11, and he says, uh, we send out a questionnaire to all the major cities in, in the United States. And I have a list here. He, he wasn't showing it to us, but he raised his hand. He said, there's a list here of all the potential terrorist targets that we ask major cities, please identify if any one of these targets are in your community. And he said, and Houston is the only city that says we have everything on that list. And this is six months after 9-11. So, so what I'm trying to get to you right now is, has, it been, has that been related to us as a community that lives here and potentially face terrorist attacks because we have everything that a potential terrorist attack would you know, want to? How are we dealing with that? When we ask those questions, guess what they tell us? Oh, we're buying surveillance cameras. That's not enough. Surveillance cameras ain't enough. We're hiring more people. Well, that's still not enough. Under the chemical security policy, the executive order that Obama say, signed before he left, and he signed an executive order because of the West Texas incident, a lot of these accidents, horrible accidents, can be prevented by using alternative fuels, alternative chemicals, and also reducing the lack of storage uh, of hazardous chemicals in, in the area, like they don't have to have a million pounds of it when they, are, they, they only need 10,000 at a time. And the other thing is in the transportation of, we have a lot of rail. In the city of Houston, we have a lot of rail that carries hazardous cargo right through the downtown area where the, where the, where the courthouses are, where the criminal, criminal, criminal juvenile detention center is, all the, the jail facility. They carry hazardous cargo through their day and day and they are. So imagine a terrorist just sets a bomb on one of those trains that, you know, detonated wherever he is. There's a lot of harm that can be caused to the city of Houston. They don't want to address chemical security policy or force the industry.
to clean up. And we're terrified. Because we talk like this and we're open about it, we have actually been investigated by the FBI for a year and a half. We were under investigation. Considered eco-terrorists because we're trying to educate people about the dangers that are here. And, and the more we fight for these issues, you know, trying to be uh, proactive instead of, you know, just sitting back and letting things happen, you know, they're just keeping taps on us, keeping taps on us. What are y'all doing? That's not right. I have two minutes. I thought that was a victory sign that we did something wrong. <laughs> just joking. Any more questions? Any more questions? Hey, look. If not, I'm happy to have spoken to you. Thank you for the invitation. And, and I hope that uh, you, you become more proactive. What we need is we need coalitions to really be built and, and start addressing not only city council, but our state to really enforce environmental regulations because we are the hub. Let me tell you what, since you said two minutes, I'll take another minute. <laughs> there are countries in South America like the Chevron, you saw what Chevron did in the, in the rainforest. And then, and then they, they took him, to, Ecuador took him to court, and they won in the international courts, but Chevron still fought. And now the courts are going to Canada, and we hope Canada makes the right decision and, and uh, rules in, in behalf of the Ecuadorian people. But anyway, because of this being the headquarters for the industry, we have, I tell, us, I tell folks, it's become like a little Greenpeace organization. Because when those countries come here, their predominant language is Spanish. So what they do is they start looking, I guess, at the phone book, or they ask somebody, well, who can we speak to that, that knows our issues and is able to speak Spanish, right? And, and I'm glad we can help. So we've got a lot of international connections. We've been to Ecuador, we went to El Salvador, we went to the Paris talks because of all these discussions. But now, uh, when I say that because we speak Spanish, right, I hope, I hope uh, Trump doesn't come looking for us, you know, because he speaks Spanish too, right? And <laughs> English. Anyway, that's it. Thank you.